We're going to start today with a discussion of the problem of universals, which uh, breaks down this way. The classic opposition is between realism versus nominalism, where realism says that universals are mind-independent realities uh, that exist in the world apart from human perception or human thought or the thought of any intellectual being. And it classically breaks down into two versions where there is Platonism uh, saying that universals are to be understood as abstract things and Aristotelianism, which says that universals are concrete things. Nominalism, on the other hand, would say that universals are not real, that there are only particulars. Only particular things exist. The oneness um, that we attribute to many things is really just a function of the mind in some way. So that's the way this breaks down, basically. And uh, the scholastics, of course, are going to be following Aristotle, and in that respect, in general, I should say, there's exceptions, but generally speaking, the scholastic uh, tradition follows Aristotle in believing that universals are real but concrete things. Why should we favor realism versus nominalism? Well, you start here with Plato's classical argument which is known as the one over many argument, which notes, first of all, that we refer to many things by the same name, which seems to um, create a presupposition in favor of their commonality. The idea that there is something universal, that all of these things that we call tree, for example, share in common. All the things that we call dog, uh, we call them all by this same name. This suggests that they share something in common. We can also observe that universals are not reducible to any particular. The universal dog is not Fido or Rover or Lassie or Benji or Snoopy, uh, but rather something over and above all of these particulars. Nor does it seem to be the case that the universal dog can be reduced to the collection of all dogs. For dogs could go uh, extinct and there would still be this universal essence dog that could become instantiated again, perhaps, you know, it could evolve on another planet um, other than the Earth. Also, um, we could say that the universal could be instantiated in a way that no human mind is aware of. There certainly could be species of animals right now on other planets that instantiate the universal of a particular type that we are completely oblivious of, that we have no awareness of. These facts point to universals being real features of the world rather than products of the human mind. In addition to that, science points to realism. First of all, if you think about a priori sciences like logic and mathematics, uh, there are universal and necessary truths that are put forth by those sciences. 2 plus 2 equals 4 universal and necessarily valid logical forms of argumentation are taken to be universally true and necessarily true. And because of this, they cannot be products of the human mind. They are not subject to the whims of the human mind. They exist in a way that seems to be utterly indifferent to what the human mind would wish to be the case or decide to be the case. Also, if you're turning to the a posteriori sciences now, we see again that the laws and the classifications of empirical science also make reference to universals. The famous laws of Newtonian physics, for example, don't uh, make claims only about some collection of particulars, but rather they make universal claims about particulars that don't even exist yet, but that will exist in the far-flung future. So science also seems to point to realism, whether we're dealing with a priori sciences like logic and mathematics or a posteriori sciences like physics. In addition, the alternatives 
uh, nominalism and uh, what's called conceptualism, uh, sometimes distinguished from nominalism, which would say that universals are just concepts. These face insuperable problems. For one thing, nominalism faces an infinite regress problem. If it tries to cite, for example, resemblance as a substitute for a real uh, universal. Uh, because resemblance is itself a universal. So what we're imagining here is that the anomalous is going to say something like, look, the reason that we call all of these trees by one name tree is not because there's a real mind independent universal at play here, namely the tree or tree, treeness, but rather just because trees resemble each other in various ways. So what the anomalous is doing here is applying the concept of resemblance to particular individual things. But the problem is that you know you just have repetition of Plato's one over many argument that comes into play here. Because uh, what we're saying is that many things resemble each other. And what do we mean by saying that they all resemble each other? Resemblance is itself uh, a universal. So you haven't really solve the problem, you just pushed it back a stage. Um, as Phaser puts, on, uh, puts it on uh, page 224, but then the problem just crops up again at a higher level. These various cases of resemblance resemble other various cases of resemblance so that we have a higher order of resemblance, which itself will be a universal. If the anomalous tries to avoid this universal by once again applying his original strategy, he will just be faced with the same problem again at a higher level, ad infinitum. In other words, um, it doesn't work to be able to, to try to say that, well, what we mean by something resembling is that there's this sort of common quality that things have by virtue of which we say that they resemble each other, some kind of more abstract quality. Once again, though, you're just stuck with the universal. And you have to say whatever this universal is, this higher level resemblance, is itself something that needs to be uh, accounted for. And then you can see how quickly an infinite regress would get started here, because if you try to account for it in terms of some other resemblance, again, you're stuck with another higher level universal. Now, John Locke was uh, what Phaser calls a conceptualist, someone who believes that universal essences are entirely the product of the human mind. But the conceptualist is committed to providing an account of how these concepts are formed in a way that makes no reference to mind and language independent essences. And perhaps you can already begin to see a problem that is going to arise here. But let's look at what Locke says. Locke appealed to the causal effects of what he would call corpuscles, little bodies, little particles, causing changes in the sense organs, and these in turn cause ideas to arise in the human mind. But notice, this sort of account appeals to mind and language independent universals, namely corpuscles and sense organs, which pre-exist human thought and language. Any kind of general theory of perception that is supposed to provide an account for how concepts arise in the mind and therefore uh, give rise to universals is going to have to itself appeal to some universal because that's a prerequisite for it to be an actual general account of perception. But how can these universals both pre-exist and be the product of human thought and language? That's the problem. Locke would be committed to saying that the universal corpuscle and the universal sense organ as universal are just the product of human mind and language. For that matter, mind itself seems like it's a universal that would have to be the product of itself. So you end up with a kind of um, incoherence in this account. On the one hand, the account needs to take um, mind to be something that is mind independent, but it wants to drive a conclusion that would seem to imply that mind has to be something that is dependent on itself. So you end up with a kind of an incoherent account here. How can these universals both pre-exist and also be the product of human thought and language? 
The scholastic, though, uh, does not advocate an extreme view of realism about essences, but rather a moderate realism. So not Platonism, but rather this Aristotelian position, which um, Phaser characterizes as the, a moderate position. The main difference is in the understanding of where these essences exist. So the Platonist is going to say that the essences, the universal essences of things, exist in a third realm apart from minds and objects. A third realm. You have particular things, you have minds, and then you have this third realm classically described as Plato's heaven um, in which exist these universals. Um, as a really existing abstract entity. The scholastic, by contrast, is going to deny this third realm following Aristotle again. Instead, they're going to say that universals exist either imminent to objects or abstracted from objects in the intellect. Either imminent to objects, this is the, um, you know, the imminent essences of things that we're familiar with from our examination of Aristotle, or the mind abstracts these essences from the objects and takes them up into the intellect. So for the scholastic, nothing abstract exists without an act of abstraction, which is performed by an intellect. Whereas for the Platonist, there is a kind of abstraction that exists sort of in itself in Plato's heaven, in this abstract realm that's the, a real realm, indeed the most real realm for, for a Platonist. So this naturally gives rise to a question. For the scholastic, are essences uh, individual or universal? And the answer is neither. They're neither individual nor universal. Um, on page 226, you see Phaser discuss this position. Uh, this is uh, this insect quotation here from Robert Pasnow and Christopher Shields explaining Aquinas' position. If the nature had individuality built into it, then it wouldn't apply to all individuals. If the nature had commonness built into it, then it wouldn't apply to any individual. The solution is to say that when we conceive of humanity, for example, the content of that thought is neither individual nor common. And Phaser glosses this by saying, the moderate realist position is thus the middle ground between unacceptable extremes. To regard natures or essences as having individuality per se or built into them would deny that there is any true universality in the world, an essentially nominalist or conceptualist position, neither of which can be correct. But to regard natures or essences as having universality per se or built into them would entail that they they couldn't truly exist in individual particular things, but only as Platonic forms. Humanness wouldn't really be in Socrates at all, nor dogginess in Phaedo, nor treeness in a tree. Neither Socrates nor Phaedo nor a tree would be a true substance any more than a shadow or a reflection in a mirror is a true substance. For like these things, they wouldn't lack any intrinsic principle of operation and the independence characteristic of substances. They would just be shadows, reflections, or emanations of a sort, which is, of course, exactly how they are treated in the Platonic tradition. Moderate realism is moderate, then, insofar as it involves no commitment to the metaphysical and epistemological baggage of Platonism. There are, for the moderate realists, no such things as mind-independent abstract objects. So universals are real, but they're real, first and foremost, concretely within the um, concrete particular things as their imminent essences, as their substantial forms. And then derivatively, they can be abstracted by the intellect, um, but still they exist, you might say, concretely in an intellect, also abstractly. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, Fazer also discusses the empiricist critique of essentialism and more or less concludes it's hopeless, largely because of the empiricist commitment to imagism, the view that concepts are kinds of images. And there are several devastating objections to this. First and foremost, that concepts are abstract and universal in a way that no image can be, and that concepts are also determinate in a way that no image can be. 
There's no way for the empiricist to coherently deny that we have abstract and universal concepts such as triangle. To deny it is at the same time to deploy it, to deploy the concept, and hence it's self-refuting. The empiricist theory of perception is also gravely deficient. It leads to skepticism and the inability to account for the perception of objects at all. It's also phenomenologically false because impressions are not more basic in our perception than objects, like books, for example. Um, rather, impressions are abstractions from human experience. In other words, you, you can talk about this book as a collection of impressions of Rectang an impression of rectangularity, an impression of, you know, brownness, an impression of whatever it smells like, uh, congested from allergies, so I can't smell it. But it smells, I assume it smells like paper, right? Um, but what I'm doing is I'm abstracting from my concrete perception, my holistic perception, holistic perception of the book. Um, and so we don't put together our um, common perception of individuals from collections of uh, abstract impressions, rather than it's the other way around. We abstract the impressions from concrete particulars. Now, the scholastic is not, in the broad sense, anti-empirical. They're not going to deny that all our knowledge must derive from experience. The scholastic shares that epistemological commitment with the empiricist. The difference is in the way in which they develop that shared commitment. So the empiricist is going to want to say that we we start with just these little um, bits of sense data, these little pixels, as it were, of sense data, and then we have to um, generate, a, you know, first of all, particular concrete objects and then universals through some kind of process of abstraction afterwards. Whereas the um, scholastic is going to say that, no, our, our immediate perception is abstracting the actual real essences of things from concrete particulars. And for my process of abstraction, then we can analyze the concrete particulars down. But we, we don't have to build them up from these, um, Im, you know, immediate impressions as, as the, the uh, modern empiricist thought. Okay. Um, so this leads us to the first discussion question today. Which view about universals is correct? Realism or nominalism? Is the moderate realist position that Phaser attributes to the scholastics a truly viable one, or do you see major problems in it? First discussion question, which view about universals is correct? Realism or nominalism? Is the moderate realist position that Phaser attributes to the scholastics a truly viable one, or do you see major problems with it? Okay. So much for that topic. Let's turn now to uh, essence and its relationship to properties. It's rather a, a natural transition to move from the discussion of universals, which we, of course, um, often associate with both essences and also the properties of things, to these, this um, general question about how scholastics conceive of a property. And it's important to distinguish here between the scholastic idea of a property and the way in which it's often conceived in contemporary analytic metaphysics. In the analytic metaphysicians, generally speaking, a property is any characteristic feature or attribute of a thing. A property is any characteristic feature or attribute of a thing. So it's a very generic concept, property. Anything can be a property. Um, whereas for the scholastics, it's a narrower notion. It refers to the proper accident, meaning a feature that's proper to the thing given its essence or nature. The proper accident, the feature that's proper to it given its essence or nature. Why does this distinction matter? Well, it reflects a difference in the way each school conceives of essence. Analytic metaphysicians see essence as a set or a cluster of properties, namely those that the thing cannot exist without. Often it's framed in terms of the properties it has in all possible worlds. For example, water has the property of being H2O in all, prop in all possible worlds because if it weren't H2O, it wouldn't be water. It couldn't exist without having that property. 
So the essence is comprised of the properties for the analytic metaphysician. Whereas the scholastics, they conceive of it as that from which the thing's properties flow, that, that which accounts for explains why it has the properties it has. Hence, it's not a set of properties. The scholastic essence isn't comprised of properties. For the scholastic, what they call the constitutive predicables, that is what is able to be predicated in a sentence grammatically, the constitutive predicles, predicables that define the genus and the species um, are what account for the characterizing predicables, namely the characteristic features of that genus and species. Okay, so we can talk about the um, features that we can predicate of an object that constituted and that account for its features. And it seems to me, I mean, Phaser doesn't go into this that much, but it seems to me that there are layers here. So, for example, to go back to the example of water as H2O, um, in, in, in one context, we might treat that as the essence of the thing, even for the scholastic. Phaser sometimes treats it this way. Um, but in another context, we might treat it as something that flows from, from the thing's essence. So, um, you know, when Phaser would talk about water being H2O uh, virtually, um, that seems to apply the idea that H2O follows from um, the essence of the thing. And when we talk about, um, for example, wetness as being a characteristic property of water, um, in that context, we could speak of that flowing from its constitutive nature as H2O. Um, and so it seems to me that Phaser isn't, I think, totally clear about this, but there's a, there's a kind of con uh, context relativity here in terms of what counts as the constitutive properties and what counts as the characterizing properties. And this goes along with Phaser's desire, I think, to... Um, be a sort of fallibilistic, um, that is to say, to be open to revision, correction, the progress of empirical inquiry and so forth in his version of scholasticism. That is to say, we don't want to be dogmatically asserting that we've discovered once and for all, you know, the essence of water is H2O and there's nothing deeper that can be said about the essence of water than that. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not true. Um, but the essence is, is it, it serves a structural role in, in relationship to the properties that um, we identify as the characteristic properties of a thing. Namely, it explains why those properties obtain in the case of such and such substance. Okay, this will become clear as we move through this. But the, the next thing to turn to is the reasons that a scholastic would give for why the essence must be distinct from the properties. Why the essence must be distinct from the properties. So, first of all, the essence must serve as the ground of unity of the properties that make up an essence. So it can't be identical to the properties. It has to serve as the ground of unity. In other words, the... Um, the, the collection of properties that are proper to some particular substance is not going to be something that explains itself. We always can ask the question, well, why are these properties grouped together regularly? And we, we observe that they occur together regularly and not, not some other set of properties. And natural laws can't do the job because the law is just a description of the way in which things generally behave given their essences. And so it can't, um, explain why they have those essences in the first place. This, of course, refers back to the, the earlier discussion of um, the status of a natural law and what's more fundamental, the essences and powers of a thing or the idea of a, of a natural law. Given the conclusion that it's actually the essences and the powers of things that are more fundamental, then we can't appeal to natural laws in order to explain why the properties that constitute the essence of a thing um, obtain in one um, cluster, so to speak. So that's the first sort of uh, reason for why the essence must be distinct from properties. Namely, 
it must serve as the ground of unity. Reason one, it must serve as the ground of unity. Second, the real distinction accounts for two facts. It accounts for two facts. The first fact is determining a thing's nature is often very difficult. So, for example, um, you know, it was a discovery that water is H2O. It took quite a bit of development in the science of chemistry in order to discover this. Uh, it's not obvious or uh, manifest on the face of it that water is H2O. So determining a thing's nature can often be very difficult. So that's the first fact that this accounts for. Um, how does it account for this fact? Well, it says that the properties that um, immediately present themselves to our senses don't necessarily give us the essence. But if the essence and the properties were just the same thing, then of course it would. To be you know, able to sense the properties of thing would be to know the essence of the thing immediately if the essence and the properties weren't, weren't really distinct. So the fact that they're not really distinct, according to the scholastic, helps to explain why it is that we can sense the properties of a thing without necessarily knowing what the essence of it is. But at the same time, a superficial understanding, for example, an understanding of water's superficial properties can often point us in the right direction. So the, the properties of the thing aren't just irrelevant to its essence. Um, they're indications of something. They tell us something about the properties that the thing has, if we have the right theory in place. Right? So these two facts um, are often, you know, they're in tension with each other. That determining a thing's nature is difficult, but yet not unrelated to the superficial understanding of the thing. The, those two facts seem to pull in different directions, but they, on the other hand, they make sense if we say that the essence is not the same thing as the manifest properties, hence not necessarily obvious, and yet the properties flow from the essence and so can point us in the right direction when we undertake to investigate the essence of a thing. Okay, so that's the second reason. The third reason is that the real distinction also makes sense of the distinction between the normal and the defective, the mature and the immature instances of a kind. So it makes sense of the, of the distinction between the normal and the defective, the mature or immature instances of a kind. Another way to put this is to say that it allows us to make sense of statements that um, Philip Afoot calls Aristotelian categoricals. For example, the statement, a cat has four legs. A cat has four legs. Now, this could be just a seemingly crazy, pointless statement, like, why am I saying that some cat somewhere has point four legs? But of course, normally if someone were to say a cat has four legs, um, especially in, a, let's say, a semi-scientific context, you would be making a, a claim about some particular cat. This, would, this isn't an existential proposition that says, you know, there exists some X such that X is a cat and X has four legs. Nor is it a universal proposition that says that all cats have four legs. Um, rather, what you're expressing is a kind of norm, namely, normally a cat has four legs. That's what it means when you say a cat has four legs or, you know, a human has 32 teeth as opposed to, you know, some other species of animal, piranha or whatever that has, you know, a different number of teeth. 
uh, what you're claiming is that a normal, mature human being has 32 teeth. A normal, and actually, it's not even um, you know a generic average because it may very well not be the case that you know the average number of teeth a human being has is 32. There are a lot of people with less, uh, for fewer, I should say, fewer teeth. Um, so, what are you describing here? Well, you're describing something like what flows from the essence of a human being. You know, in the normal course of things, unless there's some obstacle, some block or some interruption or some damage that occurs, there is going to result a four-legged cat, a human being with 32 teeth and so on. So th this is the third uh, way in which this distinction between the um, essence and the property of things helps us to um, explain something that we observe as kind of an obvious truth. Namely, we can say that the essence of the thing enables us to account for how it is that we have these sort of Aristotelian categoricals that allow us to make sense between, um, or that make, the, make sense of the distinction rather between normal and defective, mature and immature things, because what we say in these cases, or what we can say from a perspective of scholastic metaphysics, is that the essence um, causes or is the origin of certain properties. Um, the term of art here is that the properties flow from the essence. But that, of course, presupposes a real distinction between the essence and the properties. Something can possess the essence of being an eye, for example, do not have 32 teeth. Um, however, um, I am a human being. I possess the essence of a human being, even though I don't possess something that's true in this sense of an Aristotelian categorical of human beings, namely they possess 32 teeth. Um, flow from here means to be caused by or originate from an essence in the sense of formal causation. So in other words, substance have the properties that they have in virtue of their essences acting as formal causes. That describes the relationship between property and essence, which again presupposes that they are distinct. So once again, why the essence must be distinct from the properties, here is, here is the argument. Um, it must serve as a ground of unity. It accounts for two facts, namely determining a thing's nature can often be difficult and a superficial understanding can often point us in the right direction. Um, it allows us to account for those two facts both being true. And third, it makes sense of the normal or defective mature and immature uh, distinction that we want to make when we um, make statements like a cat has four legs. How do we make sense of that? It seems true, but it's not an existential statement. It's not a universal statement, literally speaking. What we're expressing is a norm that can be kept best captured in the way in which four-leggedness naturally, we might say, flows from the essence of a cat. That property flows from the essence of a cat. Uh, that presupposes, though, the real distinction. Okay, so this leads us to a uh, second discussion question. Is the essence of a thing best understood as a collection of its properties rather than something distinct from its properties from which they flow? Is the essence of a thing best understood as a collection of its properties rather than as something distinct from its properties from which they flow? What are the advantage and disadvantages of each view? So basically there I'm asking about this contrast between the scholastic view of the relationship between essence and properties, that they're really distinct, versus the empiricist view, which would say that uh, the essence is, a, is just the collection of the things properties that it can't exist without. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these of these views? All right. So this brings us to a new topic, again related, and this is the topic of modality. And by modality, philosophers mean the concepts of what is possible, impossible, and necessary. Right, so when we say something's possible, um, 
what are we saying? What are we, what are we referring to? Uh, is there a matter of fact about this? Seems like there is. What's this matter of fact about what's possible grounded in? Or if I claim that's impossible, um, is that a, a statement that could be true or false? Um, if so, what's it grounded in? Seems it is a statement that could be true or false in many cases. What's it grounded in? If I say that's ne this is necessary, what's that grounded in? Right, so modality is the metaphysical term for what concerns the possible, the impossible, and the necessary. And here, the basic scholastic principle is going to be that all these things are grounded in the real. That's the scholastic position. The possible, the impossible, the necessary are all grounded in the real. Now, the, the real, of course, for the scholastic is going to be distinct from the actual, right? So the real includes both uh, being in act or actuality and being in potency. So to say that uh, modality is grounded in the real, we're not saying that things are uh, modality, the possible, impossible, and necessary, are merely grounded in actuality. But rather we're saying it's grounded in either being in act or being in potency. And also, within the material world, if we're talking about what's real in the material world, uh, we have several aspects of this, which we can uh, analyze based upon the Aristotelian four causes. So the real in the material world is going to include prime matter, which is a case of being in potency. It's pure potentiality, pure potency. Prime matter is pure potency for the reception of substantial form. So that's one aspect of the real. We also have certain specific substantial forms, which of course correspond um, you know, to the various species of, of natural kinds, certain specific substantial forms that exist, which actualizes prime matter into a substance with various properties and powers. So once you put these first two together, of course you get a substance with various potencies or powers, but both of these are aspects of the real. We have a third various efficient causes of specific sorts. Which of course um, in the material world are going to be powers that are inherent in substances uh, by virtue of their um, essences. And then you also have certain specific um, regular outcomes, final causes. Uh, towards which these efficient causes are directed. Okay, so, so this is the, the scholastic real as it pertains to the material world. As it pertains to the material world. Now, of course, the constraints on what is real in the material world don't apply to God, who would be an example of pure actuality. So God is in, is in no way being in potency. So God doesn't have prime matter because God is pure actuality. And the um, existence of God as pure actuality, of course, is going to lead to additional possibilities for what is possible. So we, um, I just add this down here. God is pure act in our catalog of the real. This is an important list here. This is our catalog of, of what is real. Um, is of course, as a, a being of pure act is gonna be a being with purely unlimited causal power. And that of course is gonna to lead to additional possibilities for what's possible based on God's will um, we can also throw in here the nature of angels as immaterial substances, um, 
as well. So back to the main point, which is that modality is grounded in concrete reality. Modality is grounded in concrete reality uh, for the scholastic. It's going to be grounded in one of these things. So what's possible, it's going to pertain to what's possible for these realities. What's impossible is going to pertain to what's impossible for these realities. What's necessary is, is going to be what's um, going to flow essentially from the nature of some of these realities and so on. That's the way that this classic is going to account for modality, the possible, the impossible, the necessary. It's going to be grounded in these realities and what we, what can, what we can conclude um, when we reflect upon the nature of these realities, that's going to lead us to judgments about what's possible, what's impossible, what's, what's necessary. Obviously, this um, is just a very schematic laying out of the or mapping of the uh, the boundaries of the terrain, you might say, to actually uh, fully spell out what really is possible, impossible, and necessary would be, of course, a much larger, much larger task. What Phaser wants to do here is, is merely contrast this scholastic view of modality with some modern notions. Uh, first of all, the notion that modality is grounded in abstract conceivability. Modality is grounded in abstract conceivability. We saw hints of this in, in uh, Hume's argument against the principle of causality, for example. Now, the scholastic would object to this idea that modality is grounded in abstract conceivability. And the reason that the scholastic would object to the idea of modality as grounded in abstract conceivability and, and regard this as utterly inadequate to deal with the possible, the impossible, the necessary, is because this makes the less real, namely the abstract, a constraint on the more real, the, con the concrete. Whereas it's the real that ultimately should serve as the constraint on the abstract. The abstract is a mere sort of um, subtraction of reality from the real, as when we abstract the essence of a thing from a concrete particular into our intellect. So they would reject the idea uh, that the modality is ground, grounded in abstract conceivability, generally speaking. Of course, in the central case of the Thomas here is the, is the one, the Thomas, that Phaser is going to be referring to. Another modern view is that modality is grounded in concrete, actual possible worlds, uh, parallel universes. This is the view that's associated with David Lewis, that we can account for modality um, in terms of what is the case in, in um, uh, a determinate possible world or set of possible worlds, which are something like parallel universes, uh, if you want to think of it that way. Um, Phaser's objection to this is that this actually eliminate, it eliminates possibility altogether rather than grounding it. It just says everything's actual and these other things that we're going to call possible worlds are just other actual worlds. So there isn't really no possibility per se. There's just all this actuality and these discontinuous possible worlds um, and things that obtain and so on. There's other problems with this having to do with the a uh, way in which the the um, notion of possibility, which is supposed to be explained here, seems to instead just be presupposed in order to define the notion of a possible world, which of course employs the idea of possibility in the very definition of the thing that we're talking about, a possible world. The scholastic tendency um, instead is to say that we look at what's real we look at the essences of things, and um, from that we can determine uh, what sorts of things are actually going to be possible, impossible, and necessary. And that's the sense that we give to these terms, is sort of what um, is able to flow from the essences of things, what is not able to flow from the essences of things, and so forth. Now, one um, problematic exception, it would seem here, to the idea of a, um, a uh, concrete reality underlying necessity, in particular, just to stick with necessity, is that it seems like there are uh, logical and mathematical truths that are necessary, but 
are not concrete or, or have to be based in something not, not concrete because their nature seems to be abstract, essentially. Um, so logical and mathematical truths are not things that we can be plausibly thought of as inhering in substances, as one might argue. Of course, um, philosophers may attempt to give such an account. Um, but the, the way the scholastics tended to deal with this was to say that logical and mathematical truths actually do inherit something uh, concrete, um, but not something material. Namely, they inhere in the intellect of God, which is concrete, but immaterial. Okay. Um, we'll just leave that point there, but turning to the third discussion question, what do we mean when we describe something as possible, impossible, or necessary? Are we referring here to what is concretely real in some sense, or to some notion of possible worlds? In the latter case, how do we understand these possible worlds? Are they mere abstract notions in the mind? In that case, how can they establish the reality of possibility, impossibility, or necessity? Are they real parallel universes then? What problems arise with the notion of such real possible worlds parallel to our own? So, third discussion question, what do we mean when we describe something as possible, impossible, or necessary? Are we referring here to what is concretely real in some sense, or to some notion of possible worlds? In the latter case, how are we to understand these possible worlds? Are they mere abstract notions in the mind? In that case, how can we establish the reality, or how could they rather establish the reality of possibility, impossibility, or necessity? Are they real parallel universes then? What problems arise with the notion of such real possible worlds parallel to our own? So that's the third discussion question on modality. Okay, next, uh, Phaser turns to essentialism in contemporary analytic metaphysics. Um, I'm going to go over this very briefly here. Basically, the idea here is that there's a contrast between what essentialism means in contemporary analytic metaphysics and what it means in the scholastics. They're very different. And the ways in which they're different have been more or less already been laid out here indirectly. Um, that the contemporary analytic metaphysician wants to rely upon notions of possible worlds and what properties the thing has in all possible worlds in order to define necessity. Um, but from a scholastic perspective, it would be a mistake to try to determine the essence of a thing in reference to possible worlds in this way, because possible worlds exist only as an object of thought rather than in a mind-independent way. Again, unless you're David Lewis and you believe that these possible worlds are real, but um, most people don't um, buy into that. They believe that possible worlds are just sort of a, a thought experiment or something like that. But if they exist only as a possible um, object of thought, then they don't exist, obviously, in a mind-independent way. So how are they capable, then, of telling us about the essences of things, since the essences of things do exist in a mind-independent way? And this would be for the, for the analytic metaphysician who, for example, would want to say something like, water essentially is H2O in a mind-independent way, as well as for the scholastic, who wouldn't necessarily say water is H2O is the essence of water, um, at least not in the same tone of voice, as it were, for reasons I alluded to earlier. Um, but it would also agree that the essence has to exist in a mind-independent way. But the, the scholastic is going to insist that um, what the analytic metaphysician is doing is just reasoning in a circular fashion. They're supposed to explain the notion of possibility, but they're self using the concept of possible in this idea of a possible world. They're supposed to establish the uh, reality of essences of things apart from the mind, but in order to do this, they're employing a thought experiment. Um, so it seems like things are just um, upside down and backwards in the explanatory order of things. It's the essence of things that's going to explain what's true of it in all possible worlds, if you want to speak in those terms. It's not what's true of it in all possible worlds, what properties obtain with, this, with regard to this type of thing in all possible worlds, that explains the essence of the thing. Okay. 
We close then with two um, important concepts of scholastic metaphysics pertaining to essentialism. The first is the real distinction between essence and existence. The real distinction between essence and existence. And here for the Thomist at least, Of course, there's the intuitive idea here, sort of way of characterizing the distinction between essence and existence as the distinction between what it is and that it is, right? And for the Thomas, this is going to be another instance of this notion that things can be really distinct but inseparable. really distinct, but inseparable. And this is in uh, Contingent Things. Again, God is going to be an exceptional case here because in God, uh, essence and distinction, essence and existence aren't going to be distinct. God is just, the essence of God just is to exist. The essence of God just is to exist. And, um, Unfortunately, here, um, we don't have time reserved to go into topics in natural theology where we could try to spell this out and try to make sense of, sense of it, um, sort of, especially within the context of a um, specific theological tradition, which would be desirable, Christianity, of course, in the scholastic case. But um, anyway, that's the scholastic claim, that the essence of a thing, and the existence are really distinct but inseparable in the case of um, contingent things, that is, things that don't necessarily exist, things that don't necessarily exist. So things that exist but don't necessarily exist um, have a, an essence that's really distinct from their existence but is inseparable in their case. Now another um, aspect of this is an equation between essence and potency and existence and act. Essence is a kind of potency and existence is a kind of act. If we take them just um, separately, consider them uh, in themselves. Es is this, existence is viewed as an act, essence is viewed as a potency. And again, God is a unique case. His essence just is his existence because God is pure actuality without any potency. Now, even though I said for the Thomas, the Thomas um, scholastics differ on what kind of distinction, the distinction between existence and essence is, even though for the Thomas it's a real distinction that nevertheless includes inseparability. Um, and of course, this is the view that Fazer is going to favor, that the, the Thomas claim that essence and existence are really distinct, but are inseparate, uh, inseparable and contingent things. Some arguments for the real distinction. We'll go over these quickly. Um, one is that the distinction between potency and act must be a real distinction, but essence is a kind of potency and existence is a kind of act, and therefore essence and existence must be really distinct. That would be one argument. A second argument is that the existence of a contingent thing, a thing that may or may not exist, must be really distinct from its essence, otherwise it would exist necessarily and not be contingent. Another argument. A third argument, um, this is uh, around page 243, by the way, to give you a marker for where we find these. Third argument is that we can know the essence of a thing without knowing whether or not it, it exists. But if essence and existence were not really distinct, this wouldn't be possible. You know, you can know, someone can define the essence of, I don't know, Bigfoot or something and say, I don't know whether Bigfoot exists or not, but here's what a Bigfoot would be. But if essence and existence were not really distinct, that wouldn't be possible. Fourth, uh, page 245 now, there could not be more than one thing in which existence and essence are identical. For there to be more than one such thing, there would have to be something to differentiate them. But then their essence would not just be existence itself. 
So God can be the only thing in which existence and essence are identical and everything else, they must be really distinct. Otherwise, um, you know, there would be nothing to dis differentiate anything else from God, essentially. Okay, so here, Phaser takes on a bunch of objections to the real distinction. Um, that's 4.2.2. One after the style of uh, Alexander Proust that says that if something exists by virtue of adding an act of existence to its essence, then this must be the case with the act of existing itself, since, since the act of existing itself exists. And then we have an infinite regress and existence never gets actualized. This is the point at which in Phaser's reply, he makes clear that um, the inseparability plays a crucial role here. Proust's objection treats essence and existence as if it were a compound of two substances, the essence substance and the existence substance. But this is a mistake. They're inseparable. Then there's a Twitten's objection, which reads that Aristotle didn't posit a, a former, a, excuse me, a further principle, the existence of the form and the matter apart from the form matter compound itself. So there's no need to do so. Um, here, Twitten's basically imagining that Aristotle would object to this idea that existence is something separate from the form, matter, compound. In reply to this, Phaser says, well, take unicorns. Unicorns, if they existed, would be compounds of form and matter. Yet they don't exist. So therefore, existence must be something distinct from a compound of form and matter. Neither matter nor form alone can account for the existence of a thing. So existence must be something beyond it. Then we have uh, Kenny's objections that basically amount to the insistence that Aquinas has to uh, adhere to the concept of existence developed by the uh, logician um, Gottlob Frege, a seminal figure in analytic philosophy, that existence is either specific existence, which is basically the existential quantifier in logic, or individual existence. And since existence appears to mean neither of these things in Aquinas, his concept is invalid. In reply to this, Phaser says that Kenny hasn't shown why Aquinas should be bound by Frege's concept of existence. Contrary to traditional analytic orthodoxy, this isn't the only way to deal with negative existential statements. This is on pages uh, 252 to 253. You can look at that. I won't go into it here because of time. And further, he makes the point, which I think is the more telling one, then it's obvious that the Phrygian concept of existence is incomplete. So if you take an, the existential quantifier, it says basically that a certain concept is instantiated. You know, there is an X such that X is a blank. But th this doesn't explain in virtue of what that concept happens to be instantiated. Why does the concept have an instance as opposed to no instances at all? And it seems here that we need to appeal to another concept of existence. Okay, so you can look at the bottom of 253 for that. What's at stake in the dispute over the real distinction? Uh, two things, mainly. Why Phaser feels it's worth going into detail about this. One is uh, the cogency of a key argument that Aquinas gives for the existence of God. Um, depends upon this notion. So that's the first thing. This, this distinction between existence and essence figures into a key argument for the existence of God. Second, it's needed to make sense of our ability to know mind independent reality. It's because of the existence between, it's our, because of the distinction between existence and essence that the intellect can abstract the essence of a thing and consider it apart from the existence of the thing. So it's necessary um, in order to know universals that there be a distinction between the existence of a thing and, and the essence of a thing. Otherwise, all we would know are particulars. Um, and so we couldn't have any knowledge, really, uh, any general knowledge, certainly. Okay, finally, we have the analogy of being. So for the scholastics, there's three senses of the use of terms. The, there's the univocal sense. The univocal sense, where a concept is applied in the, entirely in the same way um, in different cases. So if I utter a sentence like, 
the oak tree provides more shade, but the pine tree provides better nuts. The oak tree provides more shade, but the pine tree provides better nuts. The concept tree in this example is being used in a univocal sense, entirely the same way whether I'm referring to the oak tree or the pine tree. The second example is the equivocal. Here is the opposite extreme where the concept is being implied in an entirely different way in different cases. So if I utter a sentence like, Catwoman batted her eyes at Batman and then batted a bat that flew out of the Batcave. I'm using the term bat here in equivocal senses um, to mean blink your eyes in a certain, you know, um, seductive way or something, expressive way, uh, to strike with a baseball bat uh, and a small flying rodent. Right? So those things are um, three entirely different uh, concepts of bat. So this is entirely used in an entirely same way. This is used in an entirely different way. And then finally, we have the analogical. Um, if I said something like um, two different commands, I tell you, I say, eat with your fork. Don't be a barbarian. Eat with your fork. And then if I tell you, um, if you want to get to uh, grandma's house, take the first fork in the road. Take the first fork. Here, the term fork is being used in analogous senses. It's neither entirely the same nor entirely different, right? When I say take the first fork in the road, I'm not saying um, the first time you see an eating utensil on, in the road, take it. <laughs> grab, pick it up and grab it, right? But at the same time, of course, there is a kind of analogy or similarity right, between a fork as an eating utensil and a fork in a road. I mean, you can see it here. You can visualize it, right? That there's an analogy. There's a similarity there. So those are the three senses, the univocal, the equivocal, and analogical. And of course, the view is that being, according to the Thomist, is being used analogically. Um, being is a term that is used analogically. It's not used um, univocally. There's not one sense of being that applies to all cases, uh, nor is it being used in a way that is equivocal, such that to say that, let's say, a substance has being and an attribute has being is to be um, you know, using the term in two radically distinct senses. Rather, the claim is that being is predicated analogically in the sense of a proper proportionality would be the scholastic way of putting it. Proper proportionality involves an analogous feature that exists intrinsically and formally in each, in each of the analogous. An analogous feature that exists intrinsically and formally in each of the analogous. Such, such as life exists in a plant, animal, or human um, in an analogous way, intrinsically. A plant intrinsically has life, an animal intrinsically has life, a human intrinsically has life. Um, they have it in a way that's only analogous to each other, not ex exactly the same way. But it exists formally as part of the substantial form of those substances. So being is predicated analogously in the sense of this proper proportionality that involves uh, this intrinsic and formal presence of being in the things that it's predicated on. Also, this um, implies importantly that being is not a genus. Being is not a genus. So the different um, types of being should not be understood as different species of being. And th this is distinct from the way in which animals are um, specified in different ways. Although all animals fall under the genus animal, of course, there are different species of animals. Being is not like that. Being is not a genus. On page 261, 
and this is laid out rather clearly, so I just refer to you, Phaser gives the argument that the doctrine of analogous predication of being is necessary in order to account for how act and potency can both be being. And this argument provides a useful summary way to distinguish the Thomistic position from its competitors, um, from both other scholastic positions like the Scotus uh, position or Suarez position, and also from contemporary analytic positions, and also from the Parmenidean or the Heraclitian position. And finally, bringing everything back to the beginning in a certain way here, it once again illustrates the centrality of the act-potency distinction to scholastic metaphysics.